a most original and creative talent in our business, would you welcome Mr. Orson Welles. Ladies and gentlemen, Orson Welles again, come to call for another visit. Good evening. This is Orson Welles. Well, hello again. This is Buck Benny speaking. Uh, we are delighted to have Vincent back with us. Vincent Longo is joining us for the Good first time here. in ages. So this is great. Uh, I think it's so funny, though. People tuning into this will be like, he was here on just the last one or the going before that. But it's like, okay, folks, so you know what's going on here is we're re-recording some of these for various reasons. And uh, so this is now 2024. And so you're probably getting this in 2024. And the one, the other ones you've been hearing are mostly from 2021. I mean, uh, we just I just played an episode. I was so delighted with it, where uh, on my end, my wife comes in and stop and, and interrupts us and then and then uh kathy's husband comes in and tells her it, it's when uh, it's they're talking about oh joe biden has won the nomination for president oh. of the united states so so it was you could tell it was a little while ago that we did those so uh anyway what a happy also, day. Yes. <laughs> we, also, we also have kathy fuller seeley with us it's so great to have you with us again kathy as always hey. And we were lucky enough. We're lucky enough to get Terry Phillips with us again, and uh, so we got the the whole gang here to chat about uh, Orson. Um, these Orsons, uh, at least the ones we're covering today, we'll be covering a few episodes. Um, but this first episode uh, is one where he's stuck in Chicago, and and we'll talk about this some. But um, they're mostly around Christmas time, so we'll refer to. Christmas and a number of them that we're having and things. I don't, I can't remember if he refers to that in this one or not. But anyway, let's let's start with this one. Uh, and maybe uh, Vincent usually can tell us kind of what was going on with Orson at this time. I assume he's probably getting his around the world in 80 days, thinking about getting it started or something at this point, but uh, certainly exactly. not of it. So, so yeah. So yeah, Vincent, this is the earliest mention of around the world ever actually wow. um oh, wow. earlier than any paper document anything like that this is he says he's on his way from la where he was finishing uh, his film the stranger which we talk about in a couple episodes but is a a fairly in some ways conventional film uh albeit with some of the first use of holocaust footage post-war so it's a very strange film that i recommend you uh you look at aptly titled and then he's flying to new york to speak with cole porter about what will become around the world. This is the earliest mention of it. Of course, in the meantime, he talks about his various travels and experiences on the way from LA to um, or to New York. And what I like about this is it starts off with sort of Wells seeming like he's a normal dude complaining about air travel. Uh, he's like, oh, it's so horrible, Oklahoma City, maybe it's great. I really like that, but then he quickly he quickly reminds you that he's a celebrity. Um, it becomes like, oh, you know, the other thing that I liked about this particular moment where he's in Oklahoma City is it's like um, some discourse around like celebrity and flyover states never changes. And this is a perfect example of that. He's like, oh, in Oklahoma, they never have celebrities. So it's a big deal, but they don't really know who I am really. And they don't know, they're kind of you know, slow, and you get that same thing. I'm like, wow, that's, you know, 70 years later, it's still the same Doesn't thing you change. hear. Yeah, no. Yeah, nothing's changed in how uh, either celebrities think of Oklahoma or sort of flyover states or um, how fandom is discussed. But, um, you know, I like this. I actually like this episode a lot, even though it seems, you know, kind of like a commercial for Chicago after he gets done talking about uh, Oklahoma City. I mean, he really goes into about Chicago and it, it almost probably maybe there was money involved, but there actually seems like this is a commercial for the pump room and the ambassador hotel. Yeah. Um, he goes on and on about it. You know, I think it's a really interesting uh, slice of American celebrity history, the pump room. Um, you know, we get that in LA where they talk about different restaurants and stuff. And so Chicago sticks out in this way, but um, you know, I think it also was well situating himself as a celebrity among the biggest of celebrities. He's at a point in his career where, you know, in some ways his celebrity is waning, certainly from the late 30s and early 40s. But this is a moment in which he can situate himself literally at the table with people who are really big celebrities. Yeah. Um, you know, especially, you know, mentions Jack Benny at the end of his very long celebrity list of people that he dines with at the pump room. So I think this was 
uh, both showing off how great the pump room was probably maybe he got his room for free or his food for free. He was like, cause he said he had just come from eating there. That's what he said. And so maybe it was like, Hey, can you mention us? Can you please mention us? So the pump room opened in 1938, but it becomes really big in the late forties and fifties and a little bit in the sixties. So, uh, but, you know, also well mentioning it right here. That's, that's how, it Oh comes. yeah. Cause the commentary is big, you know, big audience, big celebrity audience. Um, but the other thing that I liked about this is that, you know, he does celebrate Chicago and he did consider Chicago to be his hometown. Certainly it was the place in which he became artistic metropolitan you know he's from actually from kenosha wisconsin he spent time at a boarding school in illinois as well um, but he would go he, go to chicago quite often with his father and then um you know the person who watched after him uh, dada bernstein and this is where he learned to paint where he hung out with artists and celebrities in his early life and so this is really where he came to you know sort of grow into the larger than life um, he also believed that chicago was um really the first major city you know chicago had uh skyscrapers just as early if not earlier than new york city and so he thought of it truly as a city in a way that you get celebrated here and so i really liked it the last thing that stuck out to me and i'm hoping other people can talk more about it is two things one is could he actually have broadcast from his hotel room i know the ambassador had a radio hookup but i always assumed it was like where they played the music and it couldn't go into somebody's room but i could be wrong and then two, this episode reminded me, you know, when we when we get taught history in high school, it's like World War II was over and things were great. You know, random people kissed random people. But here Wells is like deeply afraid that war is going to start again and that the war didn't really end this time, you know, he, heating up with China and Russia. So for me, this episode is like a reminder of just when a war ends, when conflict ends, which is something we still deal with today. It's never going to feel like the ha everything is great in in times square and all that and at any moment conflict can and will arise again and so i like this episode for its sort of triptych uh journey that it takes us through excellent excellent thank you vincent uh terry what were your thoughts on this one What's well i uh appreciated his reference to uh shakespeare uh, quoting a line from henry the fourth uh, the uh, the falstaff line um Wells can't get away from from his theatrical uh, persona, and even in talking about the pump room, uh, he wasn't just a, a frequent diner there. He had his own table there. So yes, he was clearly uh, portraying himself as larger than life, but and he was larger than life. But I um, I want to talk about the the political part of this commentary. He um, dwells on China quite a bit, and. Uh, he mentions three names in that uh, in that segment, one of which I was unfamiliar with, Patrick Hurley, who had been the American ambassador to China. There was this kind of uh, rotating group of American statesmen who went there, and Hurley, uh, as Wells mentions, uh, ends up resigning. He had been appointed, I believe, by FDR, and uh, so Truman was having some trouble keeping um, uh, his envoys in various parts of the world. But he mentions China quite a bit, and then he talks briefly about Iran as well. I, one of the things that caught my ear about China was that at that time, in 1945, China had this enormous population of 400 million people. Well, they have a few more than that now. Yeah. And uh, the uh, the references to, uh, to George Marshall, of course, who was not only uh, Secretary of State at one point, but also the creator of the Marshall Plan, was a, a key figure at that time, and Jimmy Burns, Secretary of State, prior to um, prior to Marshall, uh, is mentioned in this commentary as well. And then the last thing I'd like to say about this commentary in general, you mentioned that he, or you asked whether he was actually broadcasting from the hotel. I have this question about all of his commentaries. I had the impression that he was actually recording them and not broadcasting them live. Do any of you have some insights into that? I can't. I assume see, that's correct, but I don't know. Yeah, I can't see how he could be recording him at his house and broadcasting. To me, it seems like you're recording. Uh, broadcasting it live would be totally different, more complicated situation. So I just assume he's recording these. And this is right about the time where they're starting to accept s some shows being recorded. Um, mm. It is a little surprising to me that they don't say at the beginning of it, 
something that, that, that is transcribed or mm-hmm. or recorded these are or even lear coming on and saying uh this recorded broadcast you know what the part where they say his thoughts are, are his own thoughts and they don't they're not necessarily yeah. the thoughts of lear they could easily say his recorded thoughts are you know whatever and then it yeah. would indicate to the audience that it's recorded but because usually at this point in time they were telling you if it was recorded that it was recorded but uh I don't know. I just don't see how else, like, especially this episode, I don't see how it would be possible, like, to broadcast live, to recording it. Yeah, maybe. Um, I don't even know how he's record. I mean, it doesn't seem to me like he ca- he card his recording equipment with him necessarily. But I guess if he was flying over and, and going to be in, uh, or he was probably planning to record somewhere else and, and then had his recording equipment with him. Who knows how big of a recording situation he has right well but one he's got the, somebody is able to be cut in to do the lear commercials right you know and this is short enough that would it fit it on a transcription disc so you know there was a lot of syndicated programming like the lone ranger where uh, you know uh, and superman and have to so maybe if it's a short program then yeah. it could be put out on you know the the way that shows were being syndicated at the time yeah. Sure. On, on shorter records yeah. or what have you mm-hmm. so yeah yeah it could be and the thing is chances are all he has to bring is a a, a lear wire recorder <laughs> there you go. radio i'm sure he has a 500 dollars to pay for one or or maybe he even has the tape version that he, <laughs> so that's what these are all recorded on wouldn't that be awesome the television in it too <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine the guys that are trying to get it off of those years later? It's like we got okay, we've got to build this Lear thing again and create it where we can actually play this tape that was unique to Lear. Uh, anyway, Kathy, what were your thoughts on this thing? Uh, well, it's, I I think uh, uh, my colleagues here have said wonderful things about this fascinating episode. That it really does. Uh, um, it, it has a bit of everything. Uh, Orson being Orson, Orson playing up. I I love the business about Chicago and all his famous friends. I loved at the very end how um he says uh, Merry Christmas to you, Mama. You know that was oh oh, oh he even gets that in. But um just as Vincent was talking about um this uh terror uh that the war's only been over three months, but we could start at any point uh again is fascinating to keep in mind because it's so easy as i said when one teaches this subject in the classroom to say yay busy going to disneyland in 10 years but you know uh. yeah (laughs) well and and for me the it it always surprises me just how long things have been the way they are in certain ways i mean like chicago being an airport hub i just wouldn't think about it Mm. being that case in 75 years ago but certainly it's still you know one of the hubs that you half your flight to stop in chicago as they're headed to wherever they're headed now and sure sure. yeah so and and one other thing i loved his jokes about the musical oklahoma i'm sure no one in the state of Mm -hmm. oklahoma was hearing any of the you know i mean uh (laughs) you know i'm sure they were surprised no i'm kidding yeah how (laughs) How tired must pe- people in Oklahoma have been? Although they made it the state song, so I guess there was a lot of local pride. Yeah. When uh, when did that show uh, get big? It was was it forty five or forty four or forty three something? It's been like forty three. So, but okay, I think it okay. ran a long time. So um, yeah, excellent. Um, I wanted to say quickly that you, you know Wells in this episode with the pump room. Terry mentioned this as well. Like he talks about his table. Well, I looked this up because I was curious, and apparently there's. There's about 40 celebrities who claim this was their table. If you actually look, there's actually a, a, a on Wikipedia. There's a list of celebrities which said like, "Oh, my table at the pump room," um, including Wells' own list, which is another sort of 10 people. And on this official list, uh, there's one on Wikipedia too. Wells is not listed. So there's tons of people who said this. But the thing that was unique about the pump rooms, a celebrity table, and lots of lots of um, restaurants had them. You know, in, in LA and New York is the pump rooms one was right away, right when you walked in, table number one, and they put it right to the right. And it was like a big thing that they would promise, oh, we'll get every celebrity in right away, but you have to sit where everybody can everybody see Everybody walks by you, yeah, yeah, that's great. Yep, yep. <laughs> well, and then, the, and then he mentions uh, the book 
that was about a, a semite becoming an anti-semite mm -hmm. and and uh, we were talking about it off air but what was that book again um the focus arthur miller's focus i've never read it no. i don't know much about it um mm -hmm. I, I i found wells's pitch to be interesting and strange and then i thought oh maybe maybe yeah. i'll read it has anybody here read it or know about it or no, I, I just I mean, our, we, we'd, met, we'd use that to segue into just for a minute. Okay, well, Wikipedia tells us that it was finally made into a film with William Macy in 2001. So apparently it was a little bit too um, realistic or harsh uh, for it to have been made into a movie as opposed to something like Gentleman's Agreement or uh, or things like that. Mm. So, uh... Excellent. And And before we got on the air, we were talking about uh, with all the um, protests going on at the universities and things of, uh, about Israel and, and everything. Um, uh, it generally, is, as we're talking about this, as most of my folks I've talked to, uh, protesting is fine. People can protest, and that's, that's a great thing about our country, that we allow that to happen. Um, certainly, when it becomes a problem, then then protesters have to deal with the fact that they could get arrested and so forth. But I always think it's it's good to be able to share your views and everything. The only thing I'll throw out there is if folks start um, trying to hurt people because they're Jewish and things, because somehow they connected together, it's like if they're not from Israel and things, I don't know what the connection is anyway. So you, as long as we're not hurting people, as long as we're protesting and 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 just saying how we want things to change political things to change uh wars to stop i think i think uh, uh protesting is a great thing and i'm so glad that we allow that in our country to it to some degree anyway um anyway so um aren't you going to say that your opinions are not necessarily those of the lear radio company yeah or, or my opinions are also not necessarily the opinions of the other people in our group here so <laughs> because of course the rest of us are in favor yeah. of violence right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, i didn't want to say that on the air but you know <laughs> yeah. well, I, anyway. I vote for tom lear give me smut and nothing but so <laughs> Hey, I want to mention one last thing about oh, Chicago. Sure. Go for As, it. I think Vincent pointed out uh, he talks about the uh, the 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 connection in in Chicago that the at in 1945 you could not take a train from New York to California. Well, that is still true in 2024. You have to change trains in Chicago. He he didn't know why then. I don't know why now, but I've made that transcontinental ride on Amtrak and I have no idea why you can't take a train straight across the country. Yeah. There you go. I don't but know. But certainly Jack Benny was always talking about it that you'd have to that the big crack, you know, I mean, the crack trains, the the biggest fastest trains. Yep. Had their, you know, changed in Chicago. So Yeah. Yep. And that's just what they did. So awesome. Well, thanks everybody and uh enjoy this episode everyone and uh I hope you're enjoying all these presentations we do. We certainly enjoyed doing them. It's, it's just so fantastic that these exist and we found them. Um, I just discovered a new thing today that I'd never seen before, never heard before of uh, that ties into this series. Uh, the series started uh, on the 18th of, what would it be? The 18th of September of 1945 is where we get the very first one from the 4th of September 1945, so a couple weeks earlier, it, it's a pretty funny little thing. It's it's uh, and, and it's mislabeled, so that's why I never found it before. But it says it's the it's the auditions for it's the Lear auditions for the Almanac, but it's not uh, Lear auditions. It's Lear auditions for the commentaries, and so you get to hear. There's at least one of the voices in there is the person that does the ads, the Lear ads. But there's like four or five other people that are saying the same thing, but they're different. <laughs> so you get a chance to see which announcer they went with. And I think, and if you listen to it, I'd say they totally went with the right one because his voice has that resonance. It's very, very nice, very complimentary to kind of Orson. I mean, 
because you're competing with a horse and you got to have a pretty good voice. And some of the other ones are like too high pitched or they're various things. Huh. But what I found really interesting is they're longer than you normally would get. So they go into, they talk about the, this is back before the tape recording that we get on these. This is where you, they talk about the wire, but they say, uh, what I heard that I've never heard before on the wire was the wire. They said it's a long wire that, that uh that you can record and you can record over again we know all that but they actually said you can do up to an hour of recording and i don't remember them ever saying oh. how long the recording was before that you had so they said you can do up to an hour and they said you can replace the wire which is wow uh, yeah yeah and we got a chance to see vincent's daughter what a deal very oh. cool because <laughs> she was just when we were doing these she was just being she wasn't even born yet or was it what she, born she was, yeah, she was pretty new. She was pretty new. Yeah, pretty yeah. young. Yep. Yeah, so that's pretty wild. So, yeah. Uh -oh. How old is she now? She's three and a half. Three and a half. Wow. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. I'm glad you got Ball of energy, ball of chaos. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, enjoy. We'll see you folks next time. Bye, everybody. Orson Wells speaking come to call for another talk about people and the things they're doing all over the world. We'll get to that in just a minute. It is estimated that 15 million families are waiting to buy new radios for their home. Needless to say, such a market is bound to attract all kinds of manufacturers. Some will be sound old-timers with sets that have been made for years. Others will want only to cash in on the big demand. This is why we want you to know about the background and unique position of Lear in the radio industry. Lear has been making the most exacting kind of radio since 1930. Radios for airmen. The kind of radios men stake the safety of their planes and passengers upon. This is why Lear has become known as the name men fly by. Now this long experience, foresight, and the ingrained habit of meticulous manufacture are being turned to building especially fine home radios. These radios can start out new as tomorrow yet benefit by a background second to none. Lear radios will have features never seen in home radios before. For example, there is the Lear wire that remembers. This is a method of making recordings on a wire that is built right into the set. Snap a switch, and you make lifetime recordings of your good times. Or without a sound being heard, you record broadcasts from the air to hear later and as often as you wish. This is typical of the fine things you can expect in Lear radios. So before you settle on any radio for your home, be sure to see and hear the Lear, L-E-A-R. Now Mr. Wells brings you his views and opinions on events as he sees them. The opinions are his own and do not necessarily represent the views of Lear Incorporated. Ladies and gentlemen, this broadcast, this particular broadcast, comes to you from room 942 of the Hotel Ambassador East in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, why Chicago? Well, that one's easy. I'm on my way east. I finished shooting a picture and wound up the last day of my latest Friday. Started toward New York by plane for a short business trip. The business, in case you're interested, was a talk with Cole Porter about the musical comedy we're doing together. I say I started towards New York because that's the best the airline could do. They couldn't promise me LaGuardia Airport, just a sporting spurt in that direction. By yesterday noon, the closest I'd gotten to the bright lights of Broadway was Oklahoma, and I do not mean the musical comedy. You know, that's where I was cast away of a bleak blue dawn of Saturday. I didn't notice any ballet dancing, and nobody was singing, Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oklahoma, it turns out, is also a state, and has been running even longer than the show. I'll be frank with you, friends, as a traveler fresh from the place, I can't tell you much about it. I spent what seems like many years there yesterday, but I'm confident that there's more to Oklahoma City than a crowd at the airport and a chorus of stern airline officials chanting at regular intervals the dark words, Sorry, Mr. Wells, there's nothing for you. Sorry, Mr. Wells, we haven't got a thing on this plane. Well, as the hours dragged on, I begged and pleaded for permission to go into the city for a bite of food and a little sleep until the word of my reprieve should come along, but I was told that the hotels were full... And if I ever wanted to get out of Oklahoma, I'd better live within paging distance of the airfield. Somebody was finally obliging enough to find me an old couch in the storeroom, and rolling my shoes up in my coat for a pillow, your obedient servant prepared himself for some much-needed shut-eye. But the shut-eye never came. No, not really. 
The news had somehow reached the good folk of Oklahoma that a visitor from Hollywood was in their midst. This intelligence seemed to have been telegraphed from territory to territory by drum or smoke signal because an unending stream of curiosity seekers commenced solemnly filing past my sordid little couch in the storeroom. I kept my eyes closed and tried to fool myself and the folks into thinking I was asleep, but every now and then again I, I felt in my ear the hot breath of my public. And lines like, Hey, Mildred, who says it's Van Johnson? It's only Orson Welles. And he looks worse than he does in the movies. Lines like that kept me from nodding. All in all, I felt a good bit like the corpse of Mr. Lennon in his glass trophy case in the Red Square and every bit as dead. My visitors, however, were a lot less reverent. I think it was because these morbid crowds were slowing up the efficient workings of the airport that I got out of Oklahoma City at all and as close to New York today as the Ambassador East Hotel of Chicago, Illinois. Why am I broadcasting from my room instead of the radio station, you may well ask. Well, you know, the, if you knew the housing shortage, if you know what it's like these days in this fair city, you'd understand why I don't dare to leave this hard-earned cubicle unguarded even for the 15 minutes this radio show is supposed to take. Well, actually, I'm very glad to be in Chicago. That's by way of being my hometown, you know, and of course I'm very lucky to be at the Ambassador. I'm lucky to have hotel space at all at the Ambassador, and the Ambassador, as all of us know, who know hotels throughout the world, is one of the best of all possible hotels. Dear Ernie Byfield, dear Mr. Manager, dear room clerk, are you listening? Of course, what makes the Ambassador East really grand is the pump room, that small but regal little saloon a few stories below this microphone. If you haven't been to it yourself, you've seen pictures of the pump room in Life magazine. I don't know where else. It's the place where Joe Stalin sends all the caviar the Russians can't eat, where half the beautiful people, the notable and the notorious, are to be found between noon and midnight almost any Chicago day. It's where Bert Allerton, one of the best close-up magicians who ever lived, vanishes bird cages for the customers by the fitful and expensive flicker of crepe Suzettes and cherry jubilees. As a matter of fact, almost everything you eat in the pump room comes to you swaddled in flames, a devilish conceit of that most diabolical of all Bonifaces, the aforementioned Mr. Ernest Byfield. In the pump room, even the humble hamburger is thrust upon you, spitted on a fiery sword. It's all very grand looks, and unless you're very Spartan indeed, you're likely to enjoy it as much as I do. The pump room is what it is for many reasons. It's what it is because Chicago is what it is. Because railroads long ago, and for their own mysterious reasons, decided that you can't go from the Pacific to the Atlantic coast without changing trains in the Windy City, Chicago became the crossroads for show folk and the dignitaries of government and people like that. And quite apart from being one of the best of the big towns of the earth, Chicago, for the people who move around the earth a good bit, has come to mean a place for a hot bath and such other refreshments and relaxations as the weary traveler seeks in the wayside inn. Last week, you know, they started direct air service between Chicago and London. Soon they'll be flying from here to Timbuktu, swifter than the arrow from the Tartar's bow, which means that Ernie Byfield's pump room will remain even in the age of jet propulsion, one of the stopping off places for those busy folk, some useful and undecorative, some useless but nice to look at, who are helping to shrink this shrinking globe of ours. As I say, the pump room is what it is because Chicago is what it is. And Chicago is one of the most extraordinary of all cities. One of, one of the most authentically metropolitan, I think. Sure, the climate isn't exactly perfect. I remember Ring Lardner saying that there are two seasons in Chicago. Winter and August. But you know, there's a spirit in this town. Something grim and friendly at the same time. Threatening and thrilling at the same time. You won't find anywhere else in the world. And to stop off here between planes or trains would be a great experience, even if the food wasn't so good in the pump room. I've dwelled on these matters of food because, as my tailor keeps pointing out to me, I'm very fond of eating. And in this brave new world, growing up under the lengthening shadow of the tin can, there are precious few places where the eating for any money is still civilized. Besides, the pump room is a place of many memories. There's a table there, right at the door... It's permanently reserved for your obedient servant and for the fabulous Gertie Lawrence when she's in town, for the immortal Jack Barrymore when he was in the world. Jack, you know, played here in Chicago for over a year. And week after week throughout that year, I used to fly into Chicago just to sit at that table with Jack to tell stories and to talk about the shows we wanted to do together. We did, I remember, all five acts of Othello more than one night at that table. 
I don't know what else. I've sat there into many a long night swapping gags and kicking cabbages and kings around with friends like Alec Wolcott, Thornton Wilder, and Ruth Gordon, Helen Hayes, Kit Cornell, Marlena Dietrich, George Jessel, Henry Wallace, George M. Cohan, Wendell Wilkie, Lionel and Ethel Barrymore, Lana Turner, Yasha Heifetz, Eric Johnson, Mrs. Roosevelt, and Jack Benny. Not all at the same time, mind you. Different times. And my gosh, what times they were. I've helped Morgenthau, Mr. Henry Morgenthau, map out a bond drive at that table, and I've wooed my wife there and written political columns for the newspapers, and I've just eaten dinner. So it's nice being stranded in Chicago. It always is. Coming back to that table in the pump room is like coming home. Like the man says, shall I not take my ease in my inn? Well, I learned from the mail I get from you that my gentle listeners don't tune us in on Sunday mornings just to hear about good eats and good eating places. For you who want a word about the newest book, let me recommend a novel by Arthur Miller called Focus. It's the gripping tale of an anti-Semite who falls victim to anti-Semitism. And if that sounds like nonsense, please, friends, read Focus and find out for yourself how much sense Mr. Miller makes of his melodramatic paradox. It's more exciting than the best thriller of the year. For you who want a word about the latest movie, I haven't anything to say because I haven't seen anything for a month I'd advise you to see. Then I've missed a number of the newest. For you who like the play, I'll have something to report after a week of play going in Manhattan. For you who worry over the front pages of the papers, who actually read the editorials, for you the word, my word anyway, isn't so good. Today, three months after VJ Day, the United States is at loggerheads with its allies of a few weeks ago. The situation in China is very, very bad. I think the choice in China is clear. But our American Foreign Office doesn't feel that way. We cannot intervene in China to restore the status quo. There are too many Chinese for that, 400 million of them. And there are those who say that any army we put into the field in China would be insignificant. Even the atomic bomb would not crush the resistance of those who oppose Chiang Kai-shek. Our relations with Russia are now at the zero level. Our note on Iran is tantamount to an ultimatum something which cannot be enjoyed by the American people while our wounded are still waiting for their first scars to heal. That's the situation Mr. Burns and Mr. Truman find themselves in. When Mr. Hurley resigned, there was panic and consternation. The shoot from the hip boys dug up a new ambassador in a few hours. It was a stopgap appointment. Actually, General Marshall will not be our ambassador to China. He's only the personal emissary for the president, and his appointment will be viewed as the prelude to military aid for China from the United States in greater quantity. This is natural, I think, because of his military rank. Tell you more about this in just a minute. But now your attention, please, for an interesting announcement. For more than 15 years, Lear has been building fine radios, but only aviators got them. Now you will be able to have a radio set for your home made with the same engineering foresight and the same precise manufacture. You'll find Lear home radios beautifully designed and made with the master craftsman's touch. Some include television. Some have automatic record changers, some FM and world scanning shortwave, some the wire recorder I described before. All consoles will have a surprise feature that we'll tell you about soon. And right here, there's a surprise. With all the fine features of Lear radios, they're right along in price with sets that do not offer nearly so much. The fine console combination that has television and everything sells for about $500. And at the other end of the line, there's a good-looking, capable table model at $19.95. We'll keep you posted on when you can hear these radios at your Lear dealer studios. Then you'll see for yourself how really fine they are. We know you are going to agree that you can get the most value for your investment when you buy a radio that carries the name Lear. L-E-A-R. And now a final word from Orson Welles. George Marshall is a great American... But the consequences of sending a man of Marshall's position to embattle China may be much more serious than we dare imagine. Intervention in China will merely preserve authoritarianism of the Chiang Kai-shek type for a few more years. In the end, American prestige in China will reach a new low ebb. The basic problem in the, contact, in the conduct of our foreign relations becomes increasingly clear. It looks like there's no one around the White House doing much real thinking or planning in the present critical situation. Until someone like Mr. Truman or Mr. Burns goes off to the country for a long weekend and figures out some way to stop the snowball plummeting downhill on the road to war, we'll be back selling war bonds instead of victory bonds again within 90 days. The situation may be described with the utmost calm as being desperate. 
Well, the man says my time's just about up. Thanks for letting me come to call, and please join me next week. Thanks for this time. Until then, speaking for my sponsors, the makers of Lear Radio, I remain, as always, obediently yours. This is the American Broadcasting Company. 10.30 at KECA, Los Angeles. <laughs>